morning. Welcome back to the channel. This is the Saturday edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. I need to bring you up to speed on this sentencing hearing in the former Fort Worth Police Department uh, police officer case. He was convicted of manslaughter, but stay tuned for the drama that happened yesterday. everybody crafting journey here that journey chick on instagram and on my second channel i am known as the leftovers a link to that is down in the description welcome to another edition a saturday edition of crafting and crime daily if you're enjoying the content please consider subscribing it's absolutely free hit that bell the uh the thumbs up bell the like button to let me know you enjoyed the content and leave me a comment i read all my comments sometimes i reply yeah you guys have said some great comments so just a note about yesterday no actual episode but i did a couple of lives so the first live is a little bit confusing it was the verdict in the you know the thumbnail it's red it says verdict this is the midwife case and it is the verdict but when you uh it's you don't get to the verdict until the six minute mark i'm going to leave the link to that video here but if there's chapters on it so you can just look in the description click on the chapter for the verdict and it'll take you to that then after that was done i switched over to the former Fort Worth police officer sentencing trial, and we got to listen to the psychologist live. Um, he testified, this is this guy that was named Kyle Clayton, and we'll get to his testimony in a minute, but again, there's chapters if you just wanna hear that, that's also in that video. Um, and then when they took a break, I switched over to the second thumbnail, which it actually says in the Aaron Dean sentencing. Um, and then we sat there till they broke for lunch and listened to everything. And it was just so boring. <laughs> and the reason why it was so boring is because all the good stuff happened off camera. The judge was turning the camera. I didn't realize this because they kept taking breaks and, you know, all the drama was occurring off camera until the end of the day. I've got it for you. So after lunch, I did not come back live, but I'm going to give you a clip of the drama that occurred when we get to it in the narrative today. So, um, so anyway, I don't want to spoil the verdict for you, but I just thought the result was, in the midwife case, was, I think the judge was very insightful he was very concise. He said, listen, she could have been charged with, uh, you know, practicing medicine without a license, uh, you know, the home birth, you know, negligent. He's all, it would have been a misdemeanor. And then they could have, you know, asked for an injunction to have her cease and desist practicing, you know, doing what she was doing. But they didn't go that route. Instead, they went the route of child abuse felony child abuse resulting in death. So check out the verdict. I don't want to spoil it for you. Anyway, so let's talk about this Aaron Dean case. First of all, this is so weird that the jury is deciding his sentence. <coughs> Coffee. It's so cold outside. Oh my God. Not as cold as yesterday. And we're expecting snow Thursday or Friday, right before Christmas. I can't wait. And it looks like it might last. Yes, we might get, you know, snow that lasts through Christmas. How cool is that? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas with every Christmas card I write. I sent out Christmas cards, by the way. Anyway. Almost done with the dog painting here. Yes. Um, I'm excited. Just ha have to fill in this, this finish this section here, this little bitty, you know, this section here that you're seeing and the white part here and I'll be done. This thing took, <laughs> I've worked on this off and on all year and I actually have a cat that's very similar. It's a cat landscape and I will try to get to it sometime this next year. The year of fantasy. I always have a theme for my diamond painting for my uh, people in my Facebook group, 
we're also doing a mystery diamond painting exchange in the Facebook group. If you're if you're up for a challenge, if you've never tried diamond painting, this is the time to do it. You can meet other people in the community. And anyway, check out my Facebook group. Uh, the link to that is down in the description as well. All right, so let's talk about Aaron Dean. Yeah, you don't want to hear about my nonsense, right? No, we don't want to hear about it, Rebecca. Okay, <laughs> Aaron Dean. So the jury is deciding his sentence. Now, it could be anywhere from two years to 20 years. Now, from what I understand from local reporters in that area, that if they are, if they sentence him to 10 years or less, the judge, they could recommend that it be probated, that he just go on probation. And uh, the judge would have to follow that. This is so strange. <laughs> I, I just never heard of a jury doing this. Anyway, but um, if they sentence him to more than 10 years, then probation is off the table. It can't be converted to probation. And he wouldn't lose his right to an appeal to get out on bond pending his appeal. Now, the question is, is he going to appeal? I don't know. So they started off the day putting this Kyle Clayton on Dr. I don't know if he's a doctor. He's a psychologist, Kyle Clayton. Some psychologists are doctors. Some aren't. Um, he's not a medical doctor. Let's look. We know that. He could be a, a doctor otherwise. But anyway, I'm getting far afield. So he actually examined, you know, conducted a psych psychological exam on Aaron Dean during his application process to the Fort Worth Police Department. And he said he is not psychologically fit to be a police officer. And that's the report that he sent over. And he explained that he felt like he had narcissistic tendencies, some grandiose ideas. Um, okay. <laughs> but on cross-examination, the defense pointed out that there were three, apparently he filed an appeal. And he, he had three more psychologists examine him and he passed every one of their exams. So he was hired as a police officer. Then on the stand was a woman who filed assault charges against Aaron Dean. This is so ridiculous. She was 18, he was 19, this was in college. They had both in home, they brought up homeschooled. So not probably, not, not probably the best of social skills you know, that most teenagers would learn in high school, you know, especially when you hear what he did. Um, so she goes up to this reading library that's, you know, they're both honor students. They're both part of this homeschool club. She knew him. She knew who he was. He was in the club. She started the club and she asked him to let her in. So, uh, cause she went to a back entrance. So he lets her in and she's, uh, puts her stuff down and she goes over and she leans over this table. She's looking at some kind of newspaper or news article. And he comes behind her and he puts his arms around her and he says, do you know how great you are? And he, um, she just like backed away. And then a friend came in and they were talking to the friend and, you know, they were all sitting down together. They were talking to the friend and then the friend leaves and uh, Aaron says, you know, it's too bad you have a boyfriend because, you know, I really want you. And uh, at some point he took his finger and he touched the top of her breast and she said, you know, I'm really, really uncomfortable. And she got her stuff and she left and she, she was crying and she called her boyfriend and he's, he said, go report it. And I think these were just two socially awkward <laughs> teenagers that, you know, anyway, I, this happened 18 years ago, but they brought her on. And then, uh, then there was a break in the testimony. The judge says, I have to hear another matter. And he asked the cameras to be turned off. So I'm thinking, you know, and he did mention, you know, can you send the councilman, councilman, can you please come forward? So I'm thinking, okay, this is some other matter involving a, a city councilman. I need to be diamond painting, right? Yes, you do, Rebecca. So come to find out it is related to this case that he just didn't want the, didn't want this hearing on, on camera. So apparently... This judge, he's a no-nonsense guy. He had entered a gag order 
and he charged this city councilman with violating the gag order when he gave three interviews after the verdict. Now, I'm sure it was completely innocent on this councilman's thought. He probably thought, okay, the verdict's in. I can, you know, I can, I can talk. There's no more gag order. The case is over, but the case wasn't over. I mean, we still have a jury seated, which I don't understand, but okay. And then also a Fort Worth mayor, the Fort Worth mayor who released a written statement was also charged with contempt. So they have a hearing uh, in early January, I think, uh, on the contempt charges. I'm sure they've got to go hire a lawyer and <laughs> work all that out, but wow. So then when the camera comes back on, we get uh, Tatiana Jeff a Tatiana Jefferson's older brother, and his name was uh, Adarius Carr. Apparently, mom liked A's in front of all the names. <laughs> she Everybody had an A name, Ashley, Adarius, a Tatiana. Anyway, uh, so he got up and testified about the last time he saw his sister. Uh, he's in the military. I'm trying to think what branch he said. I want to say Marines. I can't remember. But uh, she came to visit him and they, you know, so he had pictures of the last time he saw her and that, that was his testimony. So the plaintiffs, uh, the prosecution rests their sentencing case. Then the defense gets up there and uh, puts on a church friend. Uh, I don't, I didn't catch the man's name, but he uh, met Aaron through the church that they were part of. And he said he was, you know, just the nicest guy you know, he was always doing anything he could to help other people. And he was actually, Aaron's a classical pianist. And every time they would have these programs, Aaron would, uh, what do I want to say? You know, do all the music for the program, put, put together all the music for the program. Like, how cool is that? Like, he's a very good musician. Um, so then they put on a probation officer, but not the officer that would follow you while you're on probation. This is the court probation officer. Like she sits in the courthouse. She works for this judge and she, her job is basically just administrative, you know, to making sure that everyone's assigned. And then if anybody violates, she gets them a hearing and that kind of thing. But she testified that she talked about probation and what they do and what they monitor. But then when the plaintiff or the prosecution got to cross-examine her, they pointed out that isn't there over 10,000 people in this program? And she said, yeah, that's amongst 10 judges. That's over a thousand people per a judge. That's a lot. And, you know, most violations don't result in, um, probation being revoked. You can even not pay your probation fees and not get revoked. Um, and she admitted all that. Uh, then we heard, I think there was a break. Then when we came back, they put on the younger brother of Aaron Dean. Very well spoken. He's a, uh, he's a uh, headhunter, recruiter. And he explained what that is. And uh, he just talked about, you know, them growing up and playing together and, you know, think, just talked about his brother and what a great guy he is. And, you know, then they put on his younger sister. And I thought when she, she gets up and she's got this sort of um, really short haircut. And she comes up and she's got a radio with her. And I'm thinking, oh, is she a police officer? Yes, a Fort Worth police officer, his sister. She's been on the force for seven years. She was on the force before he got on the force. And she said, you know, he's very humble. He, you know, he follows all the rules. You know, there's no reason to think he wouldn't follow rules of probation. She says, these are just life rules. You know, he follows them anyway. It just, he wouldn't have to, it wouldn't be any effort for him to follow these rules of probation. He doesn't, you know, he wouldn't, <laughs> it's just stuff he doesn't ever do anyway. So she, uh, on the prosecution on cross-examination, asked her, you know, what would you have done? 
She goes, I would meet deadly force with deadly force. It's kind of a scripted answer, but I understand. And I think the, the prosecution understood that too. So then uh, after that, the defense rests and the plaintiff has, or the, pro I keep saying plaintiff, the prosecution has a chance for a rebuttal. So on rebuttal, we get Ashley Carr, a Tatiana's sister, another A, and she testified about the effects that this has had on Zion. Remember, he was eight years old at the time of this incident. He's now 11 years old. And she said he blames himself. He thinks that if he hadn't burned the hamburgers that day, his auntie would be still alive. And he gets panic attacks. He's, he's always blaming himself and, you know, crying. And uh, so they had to get him outside help. They had to get him a psychologist because um, of the effect that this has had on him. This poor child. He thinks burning those hamburgers is, well... He's not wrong. If he hadn't burned the hamburgers, the door wouldn't have been left open. We wouldn't have had this open door call. You know, Monday morning quarterback. But poor kid. You know, I bet you he never cooks hamburgers again. Poor thing. I just, I feel so bad for this child. Then, um, following that, the defense rested, plaintiff rested. And the strangest thing happened. Watch this. Is there a Mr. Mata in the courtroom? You'd stand right there at the rail for me, please, sir. Raise your right hand for me. You solemnly swear or affirm testimony given this cause to be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self of God. I don't know what. This is about. Hey, Judge, may we approach? I don't understand what's going on. I'm swearing you in as a witness. So. Under what authority, sir? All right, jury, go to the jury room. Okay. Everyone may be seated. Mr. Mata? Yes. Yeah. Is your name Manuel Mata? Yes, sir. Your date of birth is 7-8 of 1980? Yes, sir. All right. I have issued you an oath to take to uh, tell to testify truthfully. Are you going to take that oath? I have a question, sir. No. Are you going to take that oath? Uh, no. All right. Um, you are on bond on some cases. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Those bonds are being declared insufficient, Sheriff. Uh, what, sir? What's going on? What did I do? I need I need my lawyer present, sir. We will get you your have, lawyer. You question me without a lawyer present, and I don't know what you are doing. I don't know what's going on. For what? For what? I asked him a question. I don't have no I don't have no knowledge of this case. And I just wanted to know who I, who's asking for me to be uh sworn in. The defense the, the DA, the the defense, the judge, who's asking it? Those are questions just I need walk. answers if you're gonna remote me. You ain't gotta be aggressive with you, dude. Let me see the lawyers. Yeah, we can't do this. It's got to be awesome. Who's this guy? <laughs> Nobody knows. Like, you can see people in the pews going, who is it? I don't know. Who is it? Yeah. we. Nobody knows. Well, as it turns out, this guy was some kind of an activist. And he had been, you know, because Ashley had just finished testifying that following the verdict, they were very scared because there were these activists everywhere and the people screaming and shouting and they felt, she felt like she couldn't get to her car safely and she had to be escorted by the uh, police to get to her car um, because of these activists. And, you know, when she was, you know, when she was done testifying and the, the prosecution and the defense rested and they, they, uh, the investigating officer who's been in the courtroom, no, I don't know who it was. Maybe it was a defense attorney. I don't know. Uh, someone stood up and he said, so-and-so is in the courtroom. So the judge calls him forward. And that's what you see on, you, you saw the video. Um, but apparently he was one of these activists and the judge was going to ask him about it. I, I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. But after that, uh, 
the judge says, I want to see attorneys in my in my uh, chambers, and the camera never comes back. Uh, so we later learned that uh, they're going to come back on Monday for closing arguments in the sentencing phase, and then the jury will begin their deliberations about the sentence. So interesting. I know. What? Now what trials am I going to cover? I don't think there's going to be trials this week. Maybe there'll be some hearings or some interesting stuff. I mean, we'll have Murdoch Monday. We, you know, we have to have Murdoch Monday. But, and you know, find out what's going on in the uh, Alex Murdoch world. He's set for trial in January. So I, I hope that goes, because that's going to be a good one. Yeah. You know, Southern lawyers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the deep south of South Carolina. Um Let's talk about this day in history, Saturday. So uh, on this day in history, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, what did she do? I have to look it up again. <laughs> Hold on. Um, okay, this is the day that she gets sentenced to life in prison for her attempted assassination tip. Uh, assassination attempt on Gerald Ford. Yeah, she tried to kill Gerald Ford. Now, she was a member of the Manson crew. She didn't have anything to do with the Tate LaBianca murders, which were horrendous. Um, didn't have anything to do with that, but she was a devout follow, follower of Charles Manson. And following this sentencing to life in prison, she escapes. <laughs> she found out that Charles Manson had cancer, so she escapes. She's going to go help him. I don't know how, because he's in prison. <laughs> uh, and she wanders around in the forest for like 24 hours, and they finally, they catch her, and they put, bring her back, and they add five years to her life sentence. So when you're dead, we're going to leave the coffin behind bars for five more years. Um, but she got out on parole after 34 years. She's out. She's written a couple of books about her life and uh, just kind of lives a quiet life. There's not, you don't hear much about her after she got probation. She's 74 years old now, and still alive, but uh, you don't know much about her. I guess she's just living under the radar, which is good. This is good. And thinking, oh my God, what I did in my youth. Oh. What was I thinking, right? <laughs> After serving 34 years in prison. Well, I hope she's living a good life, but. And like just a, like within days, let me really see how, what, how, how many days it was. Let's see. Uh, oh, her defense for, you know, the attempt of shooting Gerald Ford was that although there was bullets in the chamber, she hadn't cocked the gun. She was, she really wasn't going to pull the trigger. So I thought that was an interesting defense. So, okay, 17 days later, someone else tries to kill Gerald Ford. Um, Sarah Jane Moore, and she, she was 45 years old. She got sentenced to life in prison, too. Leave the presidents alone. Okay, unless, oh, no, let's not, okay, we won't go down there. We're not going to go down that road. <laughs> okay, I will keep my Trump opinions to myself. Okay, that is the Saturday edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. I hope you enjoyed it. Thumbs up. Have a great day. I'm going to be live tomorrow at 11 a.m. Just talk about crafting, Christmas, decorate the tree. I know I haven't decorated the tree. What is wrong with me? Okay, <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Bye.